Hello Allegheny Astronomy students. Welcome to another introductory astronomy lecture with Bella the Cat and me, Jamie Lombardi. We're getting near the end of the school year. Here's the schedule that you can see. Right now we're recording the lecture for Wednesday, April 22nd, Life in the Universe. And that's the last chapter, chapter 19, that we'll be studying. I like to get started with an astronomy picture of the day, so we'll do that now. The one I chose is from last year, October of 2019, and it's a selfie of the Curiosity rover, which is currently on Mars. Actually, if we read the description down below, you can see that dozens of images, 57 images, were taken and then superposed <clears throat> to make this composite image here. And uh, in this region of Gale Crater, where the Curiosity rover has been exploring, it drilled into the surface and it found this clay material, which was additional evidence for there having been past water on the surface of Mars. So we'll be talking about the search for life in this chapter. We'll talk a little bit today, in fact, about Curiosity and other rovers that have been on Mars. And so let's go ahead and get into that chapter. So we'll talk about when life arose on Earth, how life arose on Earth, and what the necessities are life for life are in this first section. And so if we look back at the sedimentary rock layers, the geological record, what we see is that as you go down further and further, you're looking back further and further in time. And so that gives you a sense of relative ages. What might happen is, you have a water which is depositing layers on the bottom of the seafloor there, and then another layer is deposited on top of that, and another layer on top of that, and so on and so forth. But then the geography, the landscape of the Earth will change, and maybe you now have a river running through that region where there used to be a seafloor, and that river can erode away all those layers, and you see them one on top of the other, and the deeper down you go, the further back you're looking in time. So if a layer is on top of another, you know it's more recent, but just from that alone, you don't know the absolute ages. You don't know how many hundreds of thousands or millions of years ago you're referring to. And so if you um, want to be able to date things with uh, absolute ages, then you can use um, carbon dating, for example, or other types of radiometric dating techniques. Now, here on the left, we have a picture of the Grand Canyon. It's very beautiful. If you've never had the opportunity to be there, hopefully you will someday. It, certain portions, when you stand on the edge, you can see down over a mile vertically to the base. And that Grand Canyon records about 500 million years of the Earth's history from the top to the bottom. And you can see the different layers there. On the right, we see that there are well-preserved dinosaur fossils that are being carefully excavated by an Elvis impersonator. And if you look here, you wouldn't have to be a paleontologist to know that these are dinosaur fossils, that these were living creatures. I mean, it's obvious even to the untrained eye. It's not always quite so obvious, but here it's clearly true that you found the fossilized record of past living species. Now the earliest life forms on Earth um, are thought to be, well, from the fossil record, about three and a half billion years ago. We'll be able to stretch this back a little bit further in a moment. But there are fossils where you can see the shape of the creatures and it looks just like these dramatolite microbes that still exist to this day in Western Australia. And so the idea here is that these stromatolite microbes are similar types of creatures to some of these ones that existed three and a half billion years ago. So what is the evidence that will bring you back further than three and a half billion years? Well, you can use this carbon isotope ratio. Um, and what that refers to this is not actually a type of radiometric dating where you have something decaying. 
This is a, where you compare the ratio of carbon-12 to carbon-13. Now it's carbon, so that means there's six protons in the nucleus. Carbon-12 has six neutrons, carbon-13 has seven neutrons. And so in that sense, they differ. The carbon-13 is a little bit heavier. Now it turns out that it's more easy for living organisms to incorporate carbon-12 into their systems than carbon-13. And so as a result, if you find a fossil, what you'll notice is that if you analyze the carbon-12 to carbon-13 ratio, um, it will have a larger value than if you analyze the same ratio for some rock that never had a living creature within it. And what you can do, though, is you can find now rocks which don't have any obvious signs of fossils. There's no sort of uh, outline sketched of the creature or no fossilized bones and so on. Um, but nevertheless, if you take the carbon-12 to carbon-13 ratio, you find this larger value that is characteristic of that having been fossilized life. So what you're finding there is a rock which did have life in it in the past. It's just that you can no longer see the shape of that life. It was presumably some kind of microbial or primitive life, um, too small to have a fossilized uh, image impacted into the rock itself. Now, we have these records then of life back to almost four billion years ago. Remember, the Earth is only four and a half billion years old. So life springs up rather quickly here on Earth. Here, in fact, is a timeline of Earth's history. And the farther back in time you go, the harder it is to know what is going on in terms of evolution because we live on a geologically active planet. And so you have plate tectonics and subduction, you have erosion and so forth, which is destroying the record with time. But nevertheless, we've been able to piece together this timeline. About 4.4 billion years ago, so during the period of heavy bombardment, shortly after the Earth forms, the oceans form. And where does the water from the ocean come from? It comes from comets that hit in plenty down onto the surface of the Earth and melt and form the water. Isn't that beautiful? If there had been more comets, the water would have covered the entire Earth if there had been fewer comets, we wouldn't have as much water on the Earth, and maybe that would have made it harder for life to develop. And as we work our way along this timeline, we see that about two and a half billion years ago, cyanobacteria start releasing oxygen via photosynthesis. And over the next one to two billion years, that oxygen level builds up and accumulates until it ultimately reaches values like what we uh, have today, right? And it wasn't until about 600 million years ago that the oxygen levels reached levels that were substantially similar to what we have today. Now, um, about 500 to 540 million years ago, you have in the geological record what's called a Cambrian explosion. This is not an explosion like a Big Bang or some kind of dynamite. This is an explosion in the diversity of the uh, living species that are seen in the fossil record. Before the Cambrian explosion, there's not a lot of diversity. After it, there's all these different forms of life that you see in the fossil record. Now, the dinosaurs, they roamed and ruled the Earth from about 225 million years ago into, until 65 million years ago. And remember, we talked about that impact in the Yucatan Peninsula that seems to have caused the demise of the dinosaurs after the um, debris from that impact enveloped the Earth and caused global climate change. It's only in the last few million years that the earliest hominids arose, the hominids being what we Homo sapiens have evolved from. So here's a thought question for you. You have a time machine with a dial you can spin to send you to a random time in Earth's history. If you spin the dial, travel through time and walk out, what is most likely to happen to you? A, you'll be eaten by dinosaurs. B, you'll suffocate because you'll be unable to breathe the air. C, you'll be consumed by toxic bacteria. 
or D, nothing, you'll probably be just fine. Go ahead and pause it if you need to. Well, remember that it was only 600 million years ago that the air that is on Earth reached levels where the oxygen within it was comparable to what we had to have today. And so 600 million years, yes, that's a long time, but it's only about one seventh or one eighth the total history of the Earth, right? And so we're looking at maybe 14%, 13 to 14% chance that you would land in that 600 million year interval. The vast majority of the time, 86, 87% chance, you'll arrive at some time in the past earlier than 600 million years ago, in which case you're not gonna be able to breathe the air. And so you'll likely suffocate for that reason. The answer here is B. All right, well, how did life arise on Earth? If you look at all living species, and we often, or some of us who aren't biologists, often think about living species as being composed of just plants and animals. But you can see here on this so-called tree of life that it's so much more than that. Bacteria and, and fungi and so on have different uh, limbs on these main three branches. And all of this living, all of these living species, they all have DNA at their core. And you can kind of piece it together and see how um, not only, let's say, different species within animals correspond to one another, but you can see how plants and animals are related. They seem to have a common ancestor. This common ancestor is something from which all life arose. And we may never know exactly how the first organisms arose. Um, but nevertheless, laboratory experiments like the Miller-Urey experiment that we're about to discuss suggest plausible scenarios. And it's certainly true that the building blocks for life exist in plenty throughout. And so uh, perhaps um, through lightning strikes or um, heat, other heat sources and energy sources, you may be able to self-assemble the first living organisms and then Darwin's evolution takes over and allows you to develop um, exceedingly complicated organisms like ourself over time. All right, well, let's talk a little bit about the theory of evolution. A nice story to demonstrate the main principle is the story of the peppered moth and industrialization in England. Before in industrialization, you didn't have a lot of uh, pollution from the burning of fossil fuels and so on. And there's a type of lichen that would grow on the sides of trees that would be whitish in color. Now the peppered moth would come in two varieties, um, kind of this speckled pattern here where that's mostly white, and then this darker version of the peppered moth, right? And before industrialization, when you had all these lichen on the tree, then the peppered moth with this white version of it, that was by far the much more common version of that species. And you can see why. There's actually two different moths on this tree that contains lichen. I, you, can, you can't even really barely, if at all, make out that moth here, but the black one stands out. So um, a predator could come along, a little bird could come along and eat that black moth up easily but the uh, white version is camouflaged against the tree. Now with industrialization and pollution, the lichen on the sides of the tree starts to die away. And so the trees are now darker in color like shown on the lower right here. And then what do you think happens? It's now the darker version well, which is able to survive more easily and the predators come along and they eat up the one that is mostly white. And so here you have environmental pressures that are going to cause this and do cause this peppered moth um, to prefer this mute, previously mutated version, this version where it's black. And the numbers reverse so that the, uh, the standard, more often found version of this moth would be the black version of the moth. 
Now, as um, uh, policies were put into effect and pollution was brought under control, this started to change again, um, back towards a more balanced uh, uh, number between these two. Now, the point of this story is that just over a few generations, you could change um, what is likely to exist, right? A mutation is often bad. A mutation may mean that the particular organism uh, dies off because the mutation made it harder to survive. But in this particular case, the mutation of having this black color made those organisms more likely to survive and therefore more likely to reproduce and pass down their genes to future generations of those peppered moths. And so you see the evolutionary pressures changing um, the characteristics of the species just over a few generations. Now, if you imagine that you have not just a few generations to change, but you have millions of years for this natural selection process to play out, then you can make large amounts of change as your um, species evolves to be more easily able to survive in its environment. These mutations that we're talking about, these are copying errors that can occur in the DNA, the deoxyribonucleic acid. The DNA is what encodes what happens to the organisms. It, um, and if you make a little copying error when it's being reproduced, then uh, you might change, you might change the way that organism uh, behaves or looks um, and therefore uh, most of the time it may therefore not survive but sometimes you'll get lucky and that mutation will be a good one and then that means it'll be more likely to be passed down to future generations. Now the earliest life forms on earth may have resembled the bacteria that today you find in things such as the geothermal hot springs. On the left, we have the Grand Prismatic Spring in Yellowstone National Park. And there are actually different bacteria that live within that spring to give it that rainbow of colors. The bacteria live at different temperatures. So as you go out towards the edge, the water gets cooler and cooler, and um, different bacteria are able to survive in those cooler waters. As you go in towards the center, uh, it's hotter and hotter water, and there where you're getting to the bluer colors, um, you're transitioning from the orange to the yellow to the green to the blue. In those regions, you have different bacteria that have those different colors associated, associated with them. Now, the black smoker on the right is another area where there is life. This is really surprising. Down at the bottom of the ocean, where the sun don't shine, you've got a lot of thermal energy being released from the earth itself to cause these so-called black smokers. And what you find there is even though you don't have sunlight, there is a vast majority of life, not just bacteria, but you also find octopus species and these giant tube worms like you see in the upper right here. And there are also these water bears. Now, um, sadly, this water bear I'm showing you, this is a microscopic image of the water bear. It's also known as a tardigrade. I, would I like the idea that there's some big fat little bear floating around down by these black smokers, but that's sadly not the case. It is microscopic. Nevertheless, these water bears are really amazing little creatures. Uh, here, I've picked out a YouTube video so that you can learn a little bit more about it. All right, so we're on the YouTube channel Size Show, and we'll take a look at this video on tardigrades. Do me a favor right now and picture in your mind the toughest animal on Earth, whatever you think it is. And now imagine what that animal would do in the most inhospitable environment that you can imagine. So, for example, if you thought of a grizzly bear on top of Mount Everest being attacked by a swarm of silverback gorillas, you would be wrong. That is neither the toughest animal, nor is it the most inhospitable environment. But I thank you for the visual image. That was a good one. So you want to know what the toughest animal on Earth is? Well, voila, there you have it, my friends. It is the tardigrade, also called a water bear or a moss piglet, because they're plump and waddly and they like to suck on moss. And you may have noticed they're actually kind of cute. They're what scientists call extremophiles, which means they don't give a crap about where they live. The tardigrade's secret is that when the environment gets too tough, they just shrivel up and die for a while, with the option of reviving with conditions of 
fruit. And that is the weird thing about tardigrades. They're so extravagantly tough. Like, for no real reason, they're just supposed to, like, waddle around on moss and suck up water. That's their job. And yet, in their dormant state, they can withstand temperatures close to absolute zero and up to 300 degrees Fahrenheit. They can survive being exposed to 1,000 times the radiation that would kill an elephant. They can withstand pressures up to six times what you find in the deepest oceans on Earth. What? What is the point of that? There's no place that that would be useful on Earth. And you had better believe that we've been sending these little waddlers into outer space, because what is the most inhospitable environment? Yes, it is space. In fact, scientists think the tardigrades may be the key to understanding how life began on Earth. Back in 2007, NASA put a bunch of tardigrades on the space shuttle. Then they opened up an airlock door and left them outside in the vacuum of space for 10 days, being exposed to crazy amounts of UV radiation. Then they brought them back to Earth, and when they got there, the tardigrades were like, what's up? They were happy and healthy, and some of them uh, laid tardigrade eggs and had little tardigrade babies that were completely normal. And we keep doing it. Earlier this year, on the very last mission of the Space Shuttle Endeavor, we sent some tardigrades up, and the European Space Agency sent some tardigrades into space as part of a mission called Tardigrades in Space, uh, which isn't clever until you realize that they shortened it to TARDIS. So the question is, why do we keep shoving these adorable little beasts uh, into the vacuum of space? It doesn't seem like a very nice thing to do. Well, one, because we want to understand how tardigrades work, just scientifically, how they can possibly survive in this intense, horrible, inhospitable environments. And two, because we're interested in proving the panspermia hypothesis. That is right, panspermia, a word I'm not going to make a joke about. So imagine for a moment the meteorite slamming into our planet. And this meteorite is so large that it actually ejects pieces of the Earth into outer space. Now imagine on those pieces of Earth that got ejected into outer space, there are tardigrades. If that little organism could survive the vacuum of space long enough to then fall down onto another planet, it could seed that planet with life. If life can be transmitted in that way, then it becomes much more likely that life is a very, very common thing in our universe. The panspermia hypothesis has been around for a long time, but thanks to tardigrades, it's starting to look a lot more credible. So we can already thank these little beasts for being a great proof of concept for us, but of course, they will never know that we are so in their debt. They're just gonna keep walking around on moss, sucking water off, and occasionally visiting other planets. I'm Hank Green, that was today's SciShow Dose. We hope you learned something. So if you like, you can actually go ahead and buy some of these tardigrades. You do need to be careful depending on what state you're in and what laws there are for buying living organisms. Uh, but these things are all around and generally very safe. We had a few years ago uh, an Allegheny student who bought some of these tardigrades um, and uh, we were able to look at them under the microscope. You didn't need a very fancy microscope, any simple old little one like you might have experienced in a high school biology class, for example, would do. And so if you want to invest $14, um, you would be able to get yourself your own little bunch of tardigrades. All right, well, those kinds of creatures, these are called extremophiles, as you heard, because they live in very extreme circumstances. There's no light from the sun getting to here, and so the energy source is the energy from the Earth itself, the geothermal energy. You might have some magma underneath the ground that heats up the water and makes these black smokers, and you have some outgassing coming through these smokers. And just from that energy source, you're able to have life exist. And so when you appreciate that, um, you may start to appreciate that, okay, well, maybe elsewhere in the solar system or galaxy or universe, there could be life in places that we wouldn't have first expected. So you heard this panspermia hypothesis mentioned. This is the idea that life can migrate from one planet in our solar system to another. It could be that life originally sprung up on Mars and then some asteroid or comet comes and smacks the surface of Mars and sends rocks from the surface of Mars out into space Rocks that have things like, who knows, maybe these little moss piglets, these tardigrades. And if something like that could exist in space for long amounts of time in some shriveled up state, and then eventually, long later, fall down to planet Earth and be revived, that would be a way of taking life from one planet in our solar system to another. And so... There's no direct evidence that that's the case, but it's an interesting idea to explore. And if it were true, then in a sense, it could be that we're all Martians. Maybe our ancestors that we evolved from long before the hominids, the primitive forms of evolution near the root of the tree of life, maybe those originated on another planet and then uh, were transferred here to planet Earth. So, what are the necessities for life? 
you're going to need sources of atoms and molecules heavier than hydrogen and helium. So you probably need in your gas cloud that forms the star and the protoplanetary disk those heavy elements. And life as we know it is going to need to have something more than helium. Carbon, oxygen, iron, these all seem to be examples of things that are important. And um, you're going to need to have energy, some kind of source. We saw that it doesn't necessarily have to be sunlight. It could be chemical reactions or it could be internal heat from the planet or moon where the life is living on as in the case of the extremophiles near those black smokers. And as far as we know, you need liquid water. Now, it could be that you could have life that's formed in some kind of other liquid, maybe even an acid, but the life that is prominent here on planet Earth involves water. The water is necessary to allow things to move around and to mix. And of these necessities, Water is the most difficult to find elsewhere on other planets. And so often when we talk about searching for life on other planets, uh, we talk about searching first for water. Now there have been experiments that have been done here on Earth to try to understand better the birth of life on Earth. M the Miller-Urey experiment was one of the first and what it showed was that the building blocks of life form easily and spontaneously by themselves under conditions of the early Earth. And I've mentioned in passing a couple times Carl Sagan this semester. Uh, I uh, met him once in an elevator. Uh, I was at Cornell in graduate school and uh, one of his positions was at Cornell and he got on the elevator and he said hi to me and I said hi, and that was the end of the conversation. <laughs> so besides hearing him speak and so on uh, while he was still alive, um, that was my interaction with him. But he was famous, um, probably the most famous astronomer in terms of relating to the public that's been alive since I was born. And when I was a wee little one running around the streets of Meadville in the uh, early 1980s, this Cosmos series was wildly popular, not just among scientists, but everybody was talking about it. And I wanted to play a clip of it for you today um, about this Miller-Urey experiment. There's a few reasons. Uh, he does a beautiful job of explaining this experiment. Uh, and also, uh, some of you I know are com arts majors. You can laugh with me, I hope, at the uh, cinematography. And I also want you to hear Carl Sagan's voice and the excitement that he has. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. Uh, I don't feel right playing Carl Sagan at one and a half times speed, so we'll go ahead and we'll play that at the uh, regular speed. Now, how did the molecules of life arise? at Cornell University, we mix together the gases and waters of the primitive Earth, supply some energy, and see if we can make the stuff of life. But what was the early atmosphere made of? Ordinary air? If we start with our present atmosphere, the experiment is a dismal failure. Instead of making proteins and nucleic acids, all we make is smog, a backward step. Why doesn't such an experiment work? Because the air of today contains molecular oxygen. But oxygen is made by plants. It's pretty obvious that there were no plants before the origin of life. We mustn't use oxygen in our experiments because there wasn't any oxygen in the early atmosphere. This is perfectly reasonable because the cosmos is made mostly of hydrogen, which gobbles oxygen up. The Earth's low gravity has allowed most of our original hydrogen gas to trickle away to space. 
is almost none left. But four billion years ago, our atmosphere was full of hydrogen-rich gases, methane, ammonia, water vapor. These are the gases we should use. Taking great care to ensure the purity of these gases, my colleague, Bishan Kari, pumps them from their holding flasks. An experiment like this was first performed by Stanley Miller and Harold Urey in the 1950s. Starting gases are now introduced into a large reaction vessel. We could shine ultraviolet light on this mixture, simulating the early sun. But in this experiment, the gases will be sparked, as the primitive atmosphere was, by early light. can even make identical copies of themselves. In this vessel are the notes of the music of life, although not yet the music itself. Now, no one so far has mixed together the gases and waters of the primitive Earth and at the end of the experiment, had something crawl out of the flask. There's still a great deal to be understood about the origin of life, including the origin of the genetic code. But we've only been at such experiments for 30 years. Nature has had a four billion year head start. Incidentally, there's nothing in such experiments that's unique to the Earth. The gases we start with, the energy sources we use, are entirely common through the cosmos. So chemical reactions something like these must be responsible for the organic matter in interstellar space and the amino acids in the meteorites. Similar chemical reactions must have occurred on a billion other worlds in the Milky Way galaxy. Look how easy it is to make great globs of this stuff. The molecules of life fill the cosmos. So there's Carl Sagan talking about this Miller-Urey experiment, and it's still true 40 years later that no one has been able to create life. Yes, you can clone life, but that takes something as a starting point which is already alive to make a copy of it, right? You have not ever been able to take a box of elements and then construct them into something that is alive. And so this is a remarkable thing that has uh, come out that you have this evolution. Nevertheless, as Carl Sagan says, the elements that are readily available throughout the cosmos and the energy sources such as lightning strikes and so forth are going to exist throughout the cosmos. So if it happened on planet Earth, there's no reason not to expect that it has happened in other places as well. Uh, take these lightning strikes, for instance. Um, I brought up several other articles and so forth online just to explore this idea about whether lightning is unique to planet Earth. And the answer is no, that it's not. Right? There are people that spend their time studying these kinds of things, and you can read articles. Um, I went to adsabs.harvard.edu, and here it talks about lightning on other planets. 
And the idea is that the types of interactions that you have on Earth in terms of dust and other particulates in the clouds getting charged up, then that can happen in other star, uh, other planetary systems as well. Here, here uh, Mercury, of course, is not going to have any lightning because it doesn't have an atmosphere. Venus, though, people are studying lightning on Venus. Um, on Mars, it's a little bit harder. It's quite a bit harder to have lightning because of the low pressure, very thin atmosphere. Uh, NASA has observed lightning strikes on Saturn. In fact, here's the sequence of images taken by the Cassini spacecraft. And you can see um, the lightning strikes that are readily available in that little storm system that is going on there. Jupiter, lightning strikes have been seen on Jupiter for the first time back in 1979 when Voyager 1 spacecraft was passing Jupiter on its way out. And more recently by the Juno spacecraft, there's a little lightning strike that's happening right on the surface. Uranus and Neptune, far as we can tell by monitoring radio signals from them, um, do have uh, lightning strikes as well. So lightning as an energy source could have existed to help to spark some of those initial reactions to form those building blocks of matter. Now, in section two, we talk about searches for life on Mars in particular. Mars is a unique place because it has, at least within our own solar system, no longer a lot of water on it, but had a lot of water in the past. And we'll talk about a few of the pieces of evidence for that water. We already mentioned one of them today with the astronomy picture of the day. But the first real rovers that gave us a lot of detailed information were the Spirit and Opportunity rovers. They're no longer active, but uh, here's the landing gear of one of them. And you can see the tire tracks for this rover as it came up the embankment and then came up to the ridge here and turned around and pictured where it had landed. Now, we know from different landers, Mars is the best studied planet outside of Earth within our solar system, that there is subsurface ice on Mars. One lander landed and blew away the top few inches of dust, and there was ice right there at the surface. We have a reconnaissance orbiter going and orbiting around Mars. You're able to look at spectra of the polar caps, and you see ice of various forms you see uh, H2O ice indeed in those spectra. There still might be some subsurface water. There's indications that water even in very small amounts flows across the surface of uh, Mars before it evaporates away in this low pressure atmospheric environment. And it would be internal heat sources that would melt that ice to make those waters. Now, Curiosity rover was launched in 2011. The mission on Mars began in 2012, and it's made a lot of great discoveries. I've picked out just one of them here in 2013. It found mineral evidence that rocks were deposited in fresh water on Mars. And if there's water on a planet like Mars, that means it's habitable. Now, to say something is habitable does not mean it was habited. It means that the potential for life to exist there um, is in place. But we don't know, of course, that there's life on Mars or that there ever was life on Mars. The only place in the universe that we know for sure life exists is on planet Earth. But that does not stop us and in, fe in fact feeds our desire to look for other places where life would exist. And uh, when you're looking for life, you look for water, as I mentioned. Here's this mineral evidence that I mentioned. There's a little daily motion video um, from back in 2013 when they were discovering this for the first time, which I believe is worth watching. Hi, I'm Joel Hurwitz, a scientist with Curiosity Surface Sampling System Team, and this is your Curiosity Rover Report. 
This week, the Curiosity Science team released its initial findings from its first ever drilled sample on Mars. The sample was collected from the John Klein drill site, which is located about 500 meters east of where we landed about seven months ago. Curiosity obtained her first drill sample and passed that sample on to her onboard analytical instruments called Chemin and SAM. These powerful instruments tell us about what minerals are present in these rocks and whether they contain the ingredients necessary to sustain life as we know it. What the Curiosity team has found is incredibly exciting. When we combine what we've learned from our remote sensing and contact science instruments with the data that's coming in from Chemin and SAM, we get a picture of an ancient, watery environment which would have been habitable had life been present in it. As an example, the information that we're getting from the Chemin instrument tells us that the minerals that are present in this lake bed sedimentary rock at John Klein are very different from just about anything we've ever analyzed before on Mars, and they tell us that the John Klein rock was deposited in a freshwater environment. This is an important contrast with other sedimentary environments that we have visited on Mars, like the Meridiani Planum landing site, where the Mars Exploration Rover Opportunity has been operating since 2004. At that site, sedimentary rocks record evidence of an environment that was only wet on a very intermittent basis. And when it was, the waters that were there were highly acidic, very salty, and not favorable for the survival of organic compounds. This is in direct contrast to the freshwater environment we're seeing here at the John Klein site. The SAM instrument is telling us that these rocks contained all the ingredients necessary for a habitable environment. We found carbon, sulfur, and oxygen, all present in a variety of states that life could have taken advantage of. All in all, these few tablespoons of powder from a Martian rock have provided the Curiosity Science team with an exciting new data set that tells us that Gale Crater, and perhaps all of Mars, contained habitable environments. This is an incredible success for the Curiosity mission to Gale, and the science team is looking forward to digging deeper into Mars's ancient watery past in the weeks, months, and years ahead. This has been your Curiosity Rover Report. Check back for more updates. So that video was from JPL. And this Curiosity mission, unlike Spirit and Opportunity, is now still going on. You can check on its webpage for the latest updates. It's taken many images. It's made many wonderful discoveries. We've highlighted only a couple of them here. One of the devices that it has is an infrared laser that it can use and shine out um, uh, uh, to heat up objects that it's looking at. But you can see that there are 358 new images. There's a total of almost 700,000 images. This is how many uh, days it's spent on the planet Mars. And you can always come here to uh, mars.nasa.gov slash MSL to get mission updates on the Curiosity rover. And so um, there you go. Okay, so moving on. There's the famous Martian meteorite debate. Back in 1984, a meteorite was found in Antarctica. That's a good place to look for meteorites because you can fly over the ice sheets and the meteorites are dark and they'll stand out well. And so you land your helicopter and you record the information and you take back your meteorite for analysis. The composition of this particular meteorite indicated that it came from Mars. It probably landed in Antarctica about 13,000 years ago, and it was probably blasted off the surface of Mars somewhere around 16 million years ago. The rock itself solidified four and a half billion years ago when the um, solar system was forming, and you can make that kind of determination by radiometric dating. Now that rock, that meteorite, sat in storage for many years, and then um, people started to analyze it, and they found something interesting. They found some hints, although most scientists are not convinced that this was from Mars, they found some hints um, when looked at in great magnification of nanobacteria. Nano means 10 to the minus nine, so they're talking about bacteria on the 10 to the minus nine or maybe 10 to the minus eight meter length scale. And so these small bacteria shown uh, in that fossil over here, fossilized in the meteorite over here, are similar to terrestrial earth-based nanobacteria on the left. Now, the reason most scientists aren't convinced that this is uh, symbolizing that there was life on Mars is that, well, a lot could have happened. After all, the meteorite did sit on Antarctica for over 10,000 years, so it could have been contaminated then. In principle, it could have been contaminated on transportation to being stored and so on. And so um, it's not clear, yet this is tantalizing evidence that perhaps there could have been some life on Mars in the past. All right, well, we haven't found life off of planet Earth, but we could search on moons. We've already talked about Titan. Remember, that's a moon of Saturn, 
We saw how the Huygens space probe landed down on its surface after detaching from the Cassini spacecraft. Remember, I showed you the video of that uh, earlier in the year. And what you saw was a landscape that was eerily like what you see on planet Earth with mountains and channels cut into the sides of those mountains by rain. But there it rains liquid ethane and methane, not liquid water, because it's too cold out there to have water in its liquid form. Yet, maybe, we don't know, life potentially could exist based on other kinds of liquids, not just water. And uh, we didn't see it there on Titan. It was a very desolate landscape. Uh, but nevertheless, maybe other moons, maybe even other moons in other star systems could harbor life. Europa is an interesting moon that we hope to explore someday soon within the next few decades. It is, has a subsurface ocean. It is a very icy ball orbiting Jupiter. Jupiter. Remember, I eat green carrots is the mnemonic for remembering those Galilean moons, Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. And Europa, being that second of the Galilean moons, has the potential in that liquid water under the ice covering to have life. So someday we hope to land uh, a saddle, a, a rover there, a spacecraft there, probably near one of the ridges, and wait for water to come up or maybe drill down in. And for all you know, there could be fish in Europa. <laughs> maybe not likely, but not impossible. Nobody's proven otherwise to this point. Other moons where life could exist in our own solar system include moons around Jupiter, not just Europa, but Ganymede and Callisto. Ganymede, remember, is the largest moon in the solar system. Callisto is an ice ball. It could be that um, this resonance dance that they are involved in, um, especially Ganymede, helps to heat the interior of it and potentially life could exist. The answer to today's reading quiz is uh, water on Mars. Water on Mars. I hope that you're all doing well and staying safe. Take care.